Hi, and thank you for joining us. On behalf of Lumo and Kerasoft, I would like to welcome you to today's webcast, How to Implement an Effective Threat Hunting Practice. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Jeff Wheat, CTO of Lumo. Jeff, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Lexi. So, all right, first off, my name is Jeff Wheat. I'm the CTO for Lumu. Um, and today we want to talk to you about how to implement an effective threat hunting practice. But before I do that, I'd like to give you a little bit of context on my background so you can kind of see where some of the anecdotal evidence and some of the conversations are surrounding from and where the, the knowledge base is coming from. So uh, initially, um, NSA got me straight out of college, University of Kansas, back before anyone knew who they were, including me. I thought they were NASA, so they didn't, they didn't think that was very funny, but they got over it, so long career in that space. Since then, I've built several large uh, threat intel cells for some large healthcare groups. Um, I've also ran Anheuser-Busch's Global Sock in Bangalore, India. And then a little bit more recently before Lumu, I was a uh, CISO running an incident response group as an incident commander where we did, for example, over 75 incident responses in a period of 45 days uh, during the half EM exploit. So, That'll give you some context on where I'm pulling some of this knowledge and some of the things I say in terms of especially the anecdotal uh, evidence that I, I provide as I go along. So with that, let's talk about our agenda first. Um, first, you know, we're going to talk about challenges in cybersecurity. Uh, we're going to talk about how to develop an effective threat hunting practice. Then we'll move to threat hunting strategies and techniques, followed by key capabilities for a successful hunt, and then we'll summarize at the end. All right, so look, the, the big problem everyone has right now, the attackers are constantly employing techniques to evade, uh, evade using technologies. And, you know, we strongly, you know, the, the problem is they're moving at machine speed. And, and I'll give you an example. I mentioned the 75 um, instant responses in 45 days. That was based on Hafnium. What happened with that, and this will give you an example of how fast they can move. What happened with that is Microsoft put out a, a, a CVE on, on exchange. What the Russian business networks went and reverse engineered that exchange so that they could get in through it and put in a back door before it's called the chunking chopper. So even if someone patched, if they had gotten that in in advance, then they could still go through even after you patch. And that's how quickly they move and that's how professional they are. They move about going. So that's the problem you face. Now, the reality on your side is on our sides, we're, we're going at the speed of budgets. Right. So what you can't you can only change things as fast as you can get the finances to get the tools to do it or the people to do it or whatever. So you're always up against that deal. So that's a hard problem. So let's let's talk about why this happens. So one of the biggest problems is the current cyber defenses aren't properly addressing problem areas. And that's but one of the main reasons is we come from a culture within the, the cyber world where things were done in silos. You know, you had the old, you know, adage, you know, no one ever got fired for for buying name that vendor, right? So those were built up in silos, and those silos actually even grew with their own integrations through acquisition, and that didn't even interoperate. So the problem is, is when those systems don't interoperate and don't create that mesh, then that's that creates gaps. In, in DoD, whenever we're attacking or defending, we always create. Uh, interlocking fields of fire. And the reason for that is, is, is when it, that covers the gaps. If anything gets through the gaps and gets behind it, then bad things happen. Same thing happens in cyber. Unfortunately, systemically uh, in, in cyber, we've had that problem, is that all the systems we have may be very intelligent systems, but they're not talking to each other. So that leaves you as the analyst to figure out, you know, to stitch the story together. You just have bits and pieces of information that you have to pull together into a whole story and the whole story is the attack, right? So that's your biggest problem right now, that invisibility. Um, the other is that attackers are constantly evolving their techniques. Um, you know, look, two years ago at RSA or whatever, you didn't hardly see any API um, security platforms, right? Now you're seeing it all over the place. Well, it's because the, the attackers move to a new attack surface. They're always going to move. You know, you close the door, they go through a window. You close the window, they make a hole. It's, it's just the nature of that. And they're financially motivated to do that. And they're doing it at machine speed. And we'll talk a little bit about AI and stuff and how that works for the bad guys. All right. So that's that's the main thing there. And the lack of visibility. Um, you know, you can't 
get what you can't see. Um, so there's a lot of things out there that you, you, you're just blind to, right? You know, that's why we have put lights on the front porch and you, know, you can't defend your front porch if you can't see what's going on out there. So the, the lack of visibility is a huge problem. Uh, and we'll talk about various ways to solve that as well. So, so here's some common techniques for evasion. Um, I bring this up and I'm gonna, the one I really wanna talk about is chat GPT. But I'll tell you that as an incident commander, 90% of things started with email, all right? And everyone I, I went in with an instant response had a firewall. Most of them had EDRs, you know? So, you know, that gives you the, you know, that kind of lays out the problem for you just because you put something up, they're going to move around it. So, so let's talk about chat GPT, mostly because it's a, a hot topic right now. How's that going to affect you? in terms of what the bad guys are doing. You know, I've been on several panels where we've talked about this. The main thing with ChatGPT, ChatGPT is going to affect cyber threat the same way it affects schools and writing papers and everything else, right? It's gonna take the lesser capable people and give them more capabilities. It's not going to give you more sophisticated attacks. What it's going to do is it's going to put more sophisticated attacks in the hands of less sophisticated actors. So. The people, you know, hacking you out of their mom's basement are now going to have access to, you know, capabilities that were previously just the Russian business networks, right? That's what it's going to create. So as a result of that, it's going to create more of a volume of sophisticated attacks, which is going to create more of a need for more advanced defenses and, and visibility and interlocking and interoperability. So we'll talk about that some more. So, so let's talk about proactive threat hunting. All right, so what is proactive threat hunting? Proactive, proactive threat hunting really was 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 developed by NSA. Um, you know, when you're the world's number one, you know, military power, everyone and their dog gives you their A game, right? So they always went off the process of that they assumed they were compromised. They just had to find it. So so what we've done at Illumu is we've commercialized that concept into continuous compromise assessment. We assume you're compromised. We're just going looking to find it. So that it, when you have that mindset that I'm compromised, I just haven't found it yet, that keeps that iterative process of constantly looking for that compromise as opposed to thinking you're good and figuring out you're not when it's too late. So that's that's the underlying theory behind that. So what are some mes methodologies of threat hunting? First off is hypothesis. Is driven. This is usually based off of crowd uh, source stuff. You know, think of it in terms of, you know, the, the hafnium, for example. Um, the way we hypothesized that, we knew the techniques, tactics, and protocols of the people that were doing that. They were installing a, a power shell called the China Shopper. So what we did was we wrote scripts and we used, we happened to use Carbon Black. We used Carbon Black to find those scripts within the endpoints we would deal. Once we found them, we'd find, fix, and finish it, right? You know, but but it was that hypothesis base that, you know, the, the individual has exchange, there's a vulnerability, here's what the bad guys are doing, let me go look for signs of that, you know, that they've enacted on that. That's an hypothesis based driven. Uh, it could be, you know, we, we use multiple things, you know, threat intelligence, and a number of different things in, in this industry to figure out what hypothesis we should be going after. Um, you know, we use LinkedIn, they announced, you know, move, it's got a problem. So what is, you know, who's, you You know, do I have move it? If I have it, what are the techniques are using? So that's all hypothesis driven. All right. Next is IOC based investigations. Uh, indicator of compromise based investigations are saying, look, something bad happened at this location. You shouldn't go there. I mean, even if it, you know, it's either the bad guys, you know, they own it or it's someone else's location that they, they pwned, right. You know, and you say, well, okay, well, maybe they corrected that. Yeah, but there was a reason why they were able to pwn it in the first place, right? And you can't, you don't have insight into whether they corrected whatever those deficiencies were that allowed the bad guys to use them as a, a conduit for, for bad activity. So if you don't have a business reason to go there, you just shouldn't go there. You know, once crack house, always a crack house, just, you know, nothing good ever happens, you know, at those locations. So that's an indicator of compromise based investigation. You're looking to see, am I talking to any bad locations? You know, am I talking to anyone on the no fly list, right? The next is AI based investigation. This is where we use the power of the machine to help us. Yeah. It's a double edged sword. It's also where alert fatigue came from because it's mainly behavioral analysis. It's doing cross correlations and behavioral analysis of 
looking for known behaviors or looking for uh, things that are relative to the bad guy that starts, you know, walks and talks like a duck, it's probably a duck, you know, those, that type of, of, of level of, of area. So, so the problem is, is if you, and the, the original IDS has had this problem, right? You know, if you, if you look for everything and report everything, now I've got 10,000 events and how am I going to get through that? I mean, it's like looking for a needle in a needle stack. So, you know, you've got to say you got to tune it, but of course now you can over tune it, you know, where, you know, you tune it out and the, the bad guys do hide in the noise. So if you over tune, then they slip through. So it's, it's this delicate balance, but it, it's very valuable when used effectively. Finally is retrospective hunting. Look, you know, there's kind of an old saying that you never step in the same river twice. It's because the river is always changing, always moving. It's the same in your network, right? So what you know today or what you know today is not what you knew a week or a month or, or you know, two months ago. So you got to take this new knowledge, this new something you got out of the hypothesis driven. You know, we've got this new threat attack. You've got to be able to go back and look in that data and go, did they enact on that back in time? You can't just be in, in the moment now. You need to go back because that's not only going to tell you, did you get infected? But what's the extent of the effect, infection? What stage are they in the in the cyber kill chain, which is going to dictate how you remediate and do a number of other things. So what are the requirements? So first off, proficiency. Proficiency is people, right? All this is driven by people. You know, we're going to use automation, but you know, you, you always have to rely on the people. When we talk about proficiency with people, you know, I mentioned I ran Anheuser Busch's Global SOC. The um, the main thing I always looked for was attitude and aptitude. Aptitude is easy. You know, are they smart enough to handle this? You know, that that's pretty easy to attain. Attitude's a different story. So within this this environment, the most successful people in terms of threat hanging are the ones that are curious. All right. There's got to be a curiosity. I just mentioned the river analogy. This thing is always changing. If you're not curious, this is not a rote memorization environment. You know, if you're going off a, a off a checklist of what to look for, you know, the bad guys are way out ahead of you. That's reactive, not proactive. Proactive is is having that mentality of always understanding, not only teaching them how to think, not what to think. Um, you know, how to think, think like the bad guy. Those are the those are the individuals that do the best. The ones that think, you know, all right, this is how I would do it. You know, if you told, you know, if you're a pen tester, right? You know, pen testers make great great analysts because they know where to look, right? It's just whether it keeps them excited enough or not. That's why they like pen testing. But, you know, having that ability to think two steps ahead on the chessboard in front of the bad guys is, is critical in, in, in analysis. So, you know, and, and you're not going to get there unless you have that um, curiosity. Another trait I look for is, is, is it, you know, extreme ownership, right? You know, the, the protection genes. You know, I come from a DOD world where, you know, the, the instant responders I had were DOD trained and, and I watched them hand fight. You know, when we got into a, a ransomware situation with deal where we were getting out ahead of them, they're hand fighting with the bad guy. They're taking it personal. And if you can impart that sense of mission into your people that, hey, these people are, they're attacking your family. They're attacking this business, which might be business terminal, right? Which means you don't get a paycheck, which affects your family. It affects my family, you know? It affects every, your friends around here's family. So having, finding people that have high protection genes, I'll call it, you know, that sense of right, you know, that sense of that it really makes them angry that these people are doing it, it that motivates them to, you know, stay in front of those actors. And, you know, look, I, I've always pulled from, you know, Department of Defense for that reason. One, you know, not only do they usually have that instilled in them, but also they've been taught or been taught how to attack so they know how to defend. They think like the bad guy. They think about weaknesses. They think about what's you know the easiest way to go through. Um, threat intelligence is the next one. All right. So any battle is won, and, and cyber is a battle. Any battle is won before the first shot's even fired. You know, knowing you know what your enemy is doing, what they're going to do, what their what their capabilities are, all those things empower you to protect basically your flanks, right? You know, a lot of people ask me, what books would you start an analyst with, you know, to be a cyber analyst? I said, well, the first book I'd give him is, is Sun Tzu's The Art of War, because he think it, it's all strategy and how to think, how to think about things. You know, if the path is money, don't take the path. You know, but, you know, th things like what I just said, where, 
you know, it, it, it's won before it's even started. So threat intelligence is key. You have to have sources of information that tell you what you're up against. You know, just telling you this came from a bad location is enough. It came from a bad location because this is what they do. So look for what they do. You've always got to stay out in front of them. And you only do that with intelligence about what they are. In DOD, we have a saying, when your enemy tells you who they are, believe them. Because their TTPs are the hardest things for them to change. That's that's their R&D wing. And I'll talk a little bit more about this a little later. But those techniques, tactics, and protocols, that was the really hard part for them to develop. Once they've developed them, they mechanize them, right? So if you can thwart their TTPs and stay out in front of them, you're winning the battle. Okay, our third one is historical data. Historical data, you know, again, what you know today is not what you knew two weeks ago when your systems were reacting to that or you were reacting to it. So you have to have that historical data to go back in time. When my incident responders came in and, and responded to an incident response, the first thing we did was follow the breadcrumbs back to find first contact and all contact with that adversary. Because I haven't gotten rid of them until I've gotten rid of everything, everything they touched. You know, I've got to go back and, and validate that that's been clean because they're very good at, I call them Easter eggs, leaving Easter eggs around because after they compromise you, they're going to sell it to a lesser criminal to compromise you again. So you've got to go in and clean that out. That historical data is critical for being able to go back and get that. The final thing that really makes all this work is a continuous process. Because just because you were safe yesterday doesn't mean you're safe today. So having processes that are iterative to continually go through this process, that con uh, continuous compromise assessment, that's what's going to keep you safe because you're constantly knocking the bad guy back on their heels, right? If you stop and you relax, that's when advanced persistent threats continue because you're not looking for them. That's how they stay there, right? So you got to have a process both operationally and, and within your systems that continuously goes back and checks. And you have triggers that set that off. We're going to talk about that as well. So through all this, you know, one of the things that came out was the, the pyramid of pain. And what this is about is trying to move your organization up to the top of that pyramid to make yourself the hardest target for the adversary. Okay. Um, and, and the reason being, you know, the, the days of security by obscurity are long gone. Everything's been mechanized, right? So you no longer have that ability to just kind of hide in the weeds. They're, they're going to find you. You know, they're going to find you fast. So you, you've got to do what you can with your budgets to get to the top of this pyramid. The first one are hash values. You know, that's that's fairly trivial. Think Symantec days of signatures and whatever. The bad guys came up with a pretty easy way of doing that by just by flipping bits. So the hashes, you know, didn't always do it. So that's that's first one, but still it's still good. It just you know you just as you move up this the sophistication of the actor has to move up to thwart you. So the second one is IP addresses. You know, we can all change our, you know, I can go to a different coffee shop. <laughs> you know, you can change your IP address pretty easy, but still the fact that it came from that IP address is, is, um, is get this out of my way, is, um, is relevant, right? So it, it still matters. It's just, you know, trivial to, to circumvent. The next one is domain names. This one's fairly simple too. That's where the domain uh, generation algorithm did. Same thing as the, uh, the the hashes. They're just kind of flipping a bit in the domain. To, to You can't just name a domain. You have to move around. You have to look for those scenarios. So, but it's still, it, it's hard. You know, that's a more sophisticated technique to do that. So the lesser actors can't get around that. Uh, network host. If you're paying attention at the network host level, that's, that's where, you know, that, that's, that's the end game. That's that's where the crown jewels are. That's where they're trying to get. So if you can do put things, EDRs, things like that on that level, that, that monitor that level, it makes it even harder for them because now you're watching. It's like putting a, a you know light on the back porch now. You know, they can't come in through the back porch. So you, know, you have your triggers there. It makes it more annoying for them. They, they have to, their methods of obfuscation have to get much more sophisticated to get under those systems. So that's a more sophisticated actor. Uh, the next one is tools. Now, this is where the AI and the behavior analysis and all those things start to come in. Now you're starting to intelligently look for that actor, right? And, and they, you know, now you're in, you, now you're in a chess match with them. So it makes it much more challenging for them to get around you because of those AI tools. Will, will, the, really, the, the value of AI is the machines are able to look at a broad spectrum of information 
and pull back a story that would be difficult for a human to look across that broad space, but they're able to do it at machine speed. That's your biggest value, right? You know, the humans training the models and stuff. But your biggest value is that they can do things in bulk that would be very cumbersome for a human to do, and they can do it quickly. And that's the biggest value of the, excuse me, of the tool. Final one are the TTPs. And this is why when, when you know the TTP, when you know the actor that's coming after you, and you know their techniques, tactics, and protocols, you're in the driver's seat because where you find them in their process tells you where they're going. And where they're going allows you to get out in front and block. And that's huge for them because, like I said, their TTPs were the hardest things for them to develop. That's, you know, if any company you think of the research and development fund, right? You know, it's a fraction of the overall operational fund because it's hard, but they're trying to push the envelope. That's what they're doing with their TTPs. They're pushing those levels of the envelope to get out ahead. It's expensive, it's hard. And once they find something that works, they run with it. If you change that it doesn't work by knowing their TTPs and getting in front of them, you're forcing them to be in a constant R&D model. They're, they're spending more time figuring out how to exploit you than physically exploiting you. And that's how we break their model. I mean, that's, that's why that's critical as the top of the pyramid. And, and this is, you know, in the hypothesis hunting, this this where all the tools and the TTPs come into, into play. So <clears throat> what are the key steps to a successful hunt? There's three main areas. One's the trigger. Think of it, it's a tripwire. What are the things that are gonna, you know, you, you think of your house, it's the motion sensor that turns on the light that says something's moving in the front yard, right? It, it's those things that alert you to the fact that you might have an issue, right? So you have to have those. If you don't have those visibility, you don't know someone's in the front yard. You don't know someone's messing with the front door. You don't know someone's messing with your network, right? The next thing is investigation. Well, it may not be anything. You know, you may have a possum in the front yard. Well, that's part of the investigation, determining what's real and what you need to pay attention to. So you have to have the capabilities to do that. We're going to talk about, you know, what that takes. And finally, is resolution. Then doesn't help to know it if you don't do anything about it. You know, you've got to not only mediate which is you know block the existing threat but then you have to resolve you know any any or remediate anything additional that would have come up from that and then you need to learn from it there needs to be a reporting process you know that goes down so you can you know, dod we call it you know after action report or or a hot wash if you're in navy you know they're constantly learning from the mistakes from their gaps how do we plug that how do we make this not happen in the future and that comes through the resolution phase and the reporting Let's go into a little bit more detail what the capability checklist for each are. So with the trigger, context and visibility are huge. But uh, you know, if you like, there's a saying in baseball, you know, see the ball, hit the ball. You can't hit what you can't see, and you can't defend what you don't know you have, right? So you have to have that full visibility on your network and understand what's going on. The critical point is the network, right? All attacks come in through the network, and they came from somewhere. You know, there's there's no except insider threat maybe but um so having that visibility on that network is is key right if you can't see it happening you can't defend it so the visibility and the, and the context around what you're seeing you know not just a bunch of bits and ip addresses but some context about what those mean is critical the next thing is retrospective analysis for the same reason i just said what i know is bad today i didn't know two weeks ago so i've got to be able to go back and see was i you know where where was the point of entry where was where did this start where did this start happening because where they are in that kill chain is everything to you in terms of getting in front of them right so it, also you know you need visibility in the potential zero days that's what i mean by it. zero day is i just found out about it today you know but it's been around for a while so that's the deal. Finally, the minor uh, minor attack threat capabilities is huge. As I said, you know, as incident responders, that, that was our holy grail, right? As soon as we, you know, got the fingerprint of who we were dealing with and what they were doing, we had the minor attack methodologies to tell us where they were going to go. That's that's critical to you for a trigger, right? You know, it's like knowing that this threat actor, Emotech, came in and here's the list of things you're going to do is going to dictate my response. You know, uh, you know, if I get, you know, all right, it's just application, it looked like it was blocked, no big deal. But if it's application and everything else and I blocked it, it's it is a big deal because they're not going to stop there. You know, they they have a whole set of tools for a reason. They're going to use them. So you need to get out in front of them and start looking for other avenues that they may have come in. 
All right. So for the investigation, you know, you need to understand. If, I, I mentioned we once we got the fingerprint, you know, we, we had the keys. That's critical. You need to understand the indicators of compromise you're dealing with. So you have to have that visibility. You need to see that you're getting hit by them, not that just some random actor is doing some random behavior. You need to understand who that actor is. And that's critical for you. To, you know, it's just like any disease or anything. You got to know what you're dealing with so you can cure it, right? Um, you need to understand their contact patterns, right? Their contact patterns, you need to have some visibility in their contact patterns so that you can see that same contact pattern and make that ass assessment and, and react, all right? And then you need to know which parts of the uh, organization are being targeted. You know, if it's important to you, it's important to them. That's why ransomware works. It's a lever, right? If you know, if, if it could be PII data, it could be something that's business critical that's going to shut you down. You know, whatever, whatever it is. You know, they hit schools. Schools don't necessarily have money, but it's public money and it's hearts and minds, right? They do it because people want their kids to be educated. You know, COVID, you know, kind of kind of thwarted that a little bit and no one's got any tolerance for it. So now schools are a big target. So you need to understand what is important in the organization to the organization so that you can defend it. It's also going to set your priorities for what you defend first. You know, a lot of times, you know, I use a Kung Fu analogy, you know, block the face shots. Sometimes you're going to have to take the body shots. You know, you may not be able to get to everything, but you, you can't just random sample the alerts that are coming into you've got to go to the biggest rocks first the most critical things the most business terminal things business critical things need to be at the top of your deal your daily process of going through this in your investigations all right so resolution one you have you need to have internal tracking of it i mean you know i, I, I keep using this saying with my engineers you know if you didn't write it down it didn't happen I, I can't learn from what you did. I can't understand what you did. And it ends up just being guesswork trying to fix it if you're not tracking that, that, that incident and seeing where you need to understand where you are to get in front of where they are, right? You know, and, and know what, you know, what gaps you've left in your process. So you've got to constantly, you know, in, track that internally. You got to block it. You preferably block it automatically because it's a machine speed, but you have to have a way to block it, right? So, so that's an obvious thing. You kept an obvious, right? So the automated response is critical because the bad guy is working in an automated environment. You have to be too. You've got, we've got to move to automation, right? That's the next step in cyber. Just someone giving you alerts is not, not necessarily, the only alerts isn't doing you that big a favor. I mean, the alert's fine, but if you can't get to them, what good is it, right? So you need that automated blocking and block at machine speed. And then you need the reporting again for the after action, the, you know, the understanding that this, this kind of goes up into your business systems. You know, you need the reporting to show upper management. Yes, we're being, we're not secure by dumb luck. They're attacking us. We're blocking it, but here's the gaps they're going for. And this is why I'm asking for this new technology because they're moving to this gap. Well, if you haven't reported that, if you haven't written it down, if you can't show that to your executive leadership, you know, you can't go to the, the CEO and talk about risk. I mean, you can know, say, you eat your risk for breakfast. That's how you got this job, right? You know, he mortgaged his house for the company, right? You've got to be able to give him context as it relates to the business relevance, you know, and how that affects, what you're asking for, how it's going to affect the business relevance. And that reporting gives you that tool to do that. All right. So adversaries hide in the network. Look, you've all heard about the cyber kill chain, right? Well, you know, the five steps on the kill of the five steps on the kill chain, four of them have to have the network. You know, the first one, planning, that's stuff you can do to kind of clean up your environment. That's that's recon they've done on you, you know, on webs, you know, it's it's what everyone's putting out there on LinkedIn and everything else. You know, it's it's making your people aware of that, you know, that that password they used for LinkedIn six years ago better not be the same password you're using for the business because that was hacked. And they know you reuse passwords. It's called credential stuffing. You know, it's it, those things. That's that planning part. But the four parts, you know, delivery, exploit, command and control, and exfiltration are all reliant on the network. That's why the network visibility is critical. Um, so we're going to get into that a little bit. So Alumu, that we call this our illumination process. And I'm going to step you through how we do this, how we automate this thread hunting and the and the uh, response. First, I'm going to overlay 
those methods of hunting that we talked about before so you can see where it you know, relates to the uh, illumination process. So first, what we're going to do, metadata is key. You know, I mentioned everything's going to come in through the network. The, the, the crown jewels of understanding what's going on is the metadata in your network. You know, what, and we get that through your DNS logs and through your firewalls, you know, and proxies, syslogs, right? What we're looking for is any contact inside your network communicating out. That means you're compromised. We're not telling you what's hitting your firewall. We're telling you what got through your firewall and it's communicating back out to the bad guys. The first thing we do, this is a layout. You know, we look for the known indicators of compromise, the known domains, IP addresses, things like that. And when we see that, we automatically block that. We go to your firewalls, your endpoints, and, and we block those from happening. But we're not done because bad guys move, right? Because they move, what we're going to do is we're going to take that existing data that didn't trigger and we're going to put it through an artificial intelligence platform. And what we're looking for are anomalies of interest. We're looking for anything that, you know, is, is out of the ordinary. It's, it's odd, right? You know, it's like, you don't normally go here. You don't normally communicate this. You don't use these ports. You know, it's a number of things like that. When we see that, we don't alert on it. That's not, that's not giving you any, but you know, we, we're not going to blow you up with alerts. We're going to take that and we're going to do a deeper correlation against those original IOCs to see if the bad guys move. Right. If, if we, you know, if it walks like the ducks, talks like that, we're, we're looking for cross correlations in AI, we call it intersections and joins. We're looking for cross correlations that match those known bad actors. When we see that, that's a high probability compromise. And then, then we go back and we block that as well. But what we also do, and this is the, the retro is retrospective because that's a new known location. The assumption is, is they may have been in your network before they were known. Right. So what we do is we go back into up to two years of your data and we look for first and all contact with that threat actor, this new IOC. What that what that for helps sort is the APTs, the advanced persistent threats. So we're going back and we're going to tell you, you know, and it, it, it drives. All right. You can see the scale of the attack. And I'll show you that with the attack distribution and stuff. You can also see where you need to go remediate all those things, but you can do it rapidly. This isn't a long investigation for you. We're going to tell you everything that they can touch and go. So that's going to you know, expedite your remediation processes and, and, and getting out ahead of that. So, so Lumu threat hunting steps. You know, this is where the things that relate to Lumu overlay into these three layers. Uh, you know, your trigger, and, and I'm going to take, I'm going to show you on the platform, you know, screenshots where this occurs. We give you the incense. Those are the triggers. Uh, the playback, you know, we have a number of ways of showing you playback within the system. When, you know, if playback was initiated, that's telling you that's a new IOC, pay attention. Uh, and then we give you the global uh, MITRE attack matrix so you can understand the severity of the, the actor so you know where they react. On the investigation, we're going to give you what the threat triggers were that caused us to block it. We're going to show you a compromise radar where you can see the pattern of attack. In other words, you know, it's going to tell you, you can tell the difference between when it's mechanical, it's machine, it's going to look very regimented, whatever, spiky. When it gets random, a human's involved. Whenever a human is involved with the threat act, they are highly motivated. They've gotten to the point where they're trying to monetize it on you. So that, that should be a set off the klaxons type environment. So, and then finally, the attack distribution tells you everyone it touched. Uh, so you know where to go to, to, to clean it up. Resolution. We're we'll giving you the incident status so you can track what the status of the incident is, where it is in the operational motion and flow. You know, so you know anyone, leadership, you, whatever knows what, you know where you are, where you need to go. And then finally, Lumu Defenders is actually the part that goes. We're going to go to your firewalls. We're going to block those locations on your firewalls <clears throat> because we know who the threat actor is. We're going to then get we know what they're trying to install. You know, I mentioned China Chopper in the past. We're, they're going to know what you want to install, and we're going to pass that to your endpoints so they know to look for those hashes. So even if they do need to move to a new location, they won't be able to install the things they're trying to install. So let's talk about the individual place. Uh, first off, the uh, the triggers. So the, this is a display of the actual incidents that we send you. you know, when we send you an incident, it's in the um, it's in the platform. Automatically block it with the fender, so it's all taken care of. But it's all here for you know further remediation. We also send you an email to alert you with the link and click you take take you directly to the incident. But one of the things I wanted to point out here is if you look under labels, you can see you know 
descriptive terms like operations and high and development and high. What we do is we give you the ability to label your network. I call it poor man's network segmentation. We should do it correctly, but sometimes it ends up being floors on a building, right? So what we allow you to do, that allows you to prioritize. We allow you to, to label it both functionally, could be operations, development, guess Wi-Fi, but we also allow you to give a business relevance tag to it as high, medium, or low. That allows you to prioritize. Look, if something hit something high and I saw you know, a, a, a broad spectrum on the minor you know, attack spectrum, all these things are going to designate which things you work on first and how fast you work on them and how, mu how much remediation you're going to do. So we provide you that ability. We also give you playback in here. You can do it one of two ways. You can either filter these lists, you can filter them by these high, medium, and lows too. Uh, you can filter by playback or it, it, next to the um, the threat description there, there'll be a little clock. So you can always, you're always going to visually spot when you've got a playback. And personally, any playback, I'm all over because I want to know, you know, this is something that it's a, it's a zero day. I want to go back and figure out I'm safe. So that was for triggers uh, or we're still in triggers. All right. So in this screen yeah you can see who the threat actor is what we triggered on what's the location you know we're showing you the miter attack methods of this threat actor <clears throat> now this one's more serious because it's not just an application layer protocol but they use command and control for data exfiltration so that combined with who it was in contact with really matters to me if that's anywhere near my database with pii data I, i'm really concerned right you know so th these are the layers of granularity that's going to give you and stuff and to be able to determine your um, your next steps. And then investigation, this is the attack distribution I talked about. You just look on the, the left. So on the left, you can see, you know, and this came from a playback because it, it went back. So you can see that BDM LCASDEX was patient zero, right? And you can see it continued throughout the process with them. And then you can see down how it's spreading to different parts of the organization. That's how an attack works, right? You know, they get in, they, you know, they accelerate privileges, they do a number of things. And once I've got an anchor point, they're going, you know, they're going to move. Now, in, in this case, you know, as an instant responder, where I saw this happen a lot was unattended accounts. Um, you know, there wasn't someone there, you know, say, see something, say something, right? You know, there wasn't someone there to tell that the cursor was moving around or that the email was exploited, right? So these are the things you're looking for to see not only, you know, who's, who's my main source that I got to go back to, but who are all the things that it contacted? So I need to do a deeper dive on those to see if they're able to penetrate those further. Now let's talk about the compromise radar on the right. Um, you can see the spikes. Basically, this is based on hours in a day, 24 hour clock, and the number of contacts and whatever. It's showing you the pattern of attack, how much, how many things we're doing. The thing is, when machines are scanning, they do it by set numbers. So you're going to see spikes. So sometimes you may see we blocked one and got one spike. Okay, it was probably just scanning. We, we got it. We blocked it. In this case, you can see the kind of green area that looks not a normal, um, you know, not a very distinct, you know, shape. That's that's non-random. All right, I mean that's random. So humans are random. What that tells me is a human is now in the network. It's, it's moved to the point, and that combined with the attack distribution. It's moved to the point that there, there's a further on exploit that a human is involved. And these are the kind of patterns that we give to you very quickly to automate the process to pull all that out and say, boom, 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 there you go, you're out. The industry standard for investigations for like you know, MDR SOC or anywhere, anyone with a SOC, is roughly 10 minutes plus for, a, um, for an investigation. That's, that matches my experience with Anheuser Bush. What we found with the Luma, with this automated you know, context that we give you, we block in milliseconds, right? But with the context we give you, the remediation understanding process, we've been able to narrow down to about a minute. Usually when I demo the platform, I usually take someone through an investigation. It usually takes me 30 seconds to go through. I'm looking at this, this, and this. This matters. I'm going to push this up to the remediation team. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take down that time in which the enemy can operate in the area in which they can operate in your, in your environment. So that's the whole purpose of that. So further investigation, these are the trigger points. Uh, when we say a domain, we're not going to block GoDaddy or Microsoft. We're going to take you actually down to the path where the, you know, the threat activity occurs. Um, you can see in this case, this one had 49 uh, hashes associated, 49 different signatures for things they're trying to install. These are the things we're going to pass over to the EDRs. 
uh, you know, we're telling the firewall to block this domain or IP address, whichever it is. So you can see that, but you know, we give you this context as well, so you understand. Uh, and finally, it's resolution. You know, you can see over here on the right where it says automated response and first threat, first threat contact that we did that in milliseconds. You know, it went from 0.19 to 0.54 before. And these are the the integrations that we have out of the box. We have a number. We have over 80 of them that we integrated with to to help defend this network. Right in this particular case. Now, this is our demo one, so there's quite a few. You'll probably just have a couple. The other part is that you you always want to comment the instant. We give you operational efficiency in terms of, you know, we'll, we'll integrate with your PSA so that when you close a ticket on us, it's closed on you, you know, back and forth. You know, it all works. It's all well done the way we've done that for operational efficiency. So um, with that, I want to... I want to play a video. You know, it's one thing to hear it from me. I want you to hear it from a, a you know, a, a sled customer we have and how they've used it and what, what the value is. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause my speech right here and play this for you really quickly. Bear with me. Hey, I'm Joe McNichol. I'm the IT director here at the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau. <laughs> Our responsibilities here at the Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau is to create a positive economic impact for the Philadelphia region and our 14,000 hotel rooms, hundreds of restaurants, small mom and pop shops, museums, and attractions. Before Lumu, we were relying on our firewall, antivirus, spam filters, staff training for cybersecurity, and prayers. The main void Lumu filled for us was our shorthanded staff. We didn't have a dedicated security analyst um, to be able to constantly monitor our network and scan for malicious activity. Lumu is our partner in doing that. Lumu gives us great visibility uh, within our network and they integrate seamlessly with our current security stack. I would say the overarching benefit from us having Lumu is I can sleep at night. It's that simple. Shortly after we installed Lumu, we were notified about a command and control attack. Lumu picked up the event through our FortiGate firewall logs was able to uh, use the Lumu Defender to block the attack. Uh, we gave us the IP address of the incident and we were able to create a custom rule on our firewall to block any future activity from that bad actor. If we hadn't picked this up, that bad actor would be sitting on our network, moving laterally, um, doing reconnaissance, doing credential dumping, and eventually elevating privileges to admin privileges. What's great about Lumu is it continuously monitors our network for us. And if it does find an incident, it automatically responds and handles that incident for us. We then receive an email about the incident and we can dig deeper and investigate further into the incident. It's a huge benefit to have this type of technology in place for us. Lumu's dashboard is simple to use. It's clean, it's comprehensive, gives you great insight and information about the, pro uh, about the threat. And um, you can just dig and dig deeper uh, about that threat and read articles. And it can tell you how to prevent it in the future, what it was trying to do. and. Um, there's just a ton of information. You can you can really dig deep into the uh, information that Lumu's gives you in the portal. If you're an organization like I was without a network detection and response tool on your security stack, I would definitely give Lumu a test drive. Lumu is easy to install. It's lightweight on the network and the endpoints, and it's easy to use. Since we don't have a full-time cybersecurity person on staff, Lumu has become our virtual cybersecurity analyst.
All right. Two favorite statements out there. I can sleep at night and Lumu is our, our, our uh, cyber analyst. So, you know, it, it's one of the reasons we're really, really strong in SLED is because, you know, they're kind of, you know, underfunded and, and, and over attacked. So, you know, I, I put this up on the screen, you know, the code there, we do have a free version. You can download, kick the tires, you know, drive it like you stole it. Um, it it's going to tell you where your, your threats are coming in. It won't give you the context and stuff. We have to sell something. But if you want to download that and try us for free, please do. Um, you know, like I say, we're fully transparent on what we do. Um, and with that, I would like to take any questions we might have. Lexi, do you have any questions coming up? Or Kara? Yeah, yeah, we, it does look like we do have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one is, would this product be used on top of, say, XDR software, such as Carbon Black um, or Sophos or in place of? We, we integrate with those platforms, uh, Carbon Black and, and Sophos. So, you know, I, I mentioned stitching them together. Um, XDRs, I don't know, you know, look, I'm an engineer, I'm not a marketer. To me, it's kind of a marketing term, but, you know, it means one thing to one or another. We don't fit neatly in a in a bucket because we do so much integration. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about was I mentioned, you know, 90% of things come in through email. We integrate with uh, Microsoft Outlook and we're working on the Gmail. What we do is we look for those same locations in email. We don't block the email. What we do is if someone clicks on those locations in email, we're going to block it at the firewall. And then we're going to give that cross correlation and show the campaign of what was happening with the email, what email it was, who it hit, things like that. So, you know, it, it's all this intelligence that we're providing around to stitch all those things together. Like, I love Carbon Black, right? You know, we work with Carbon Black, but when you have an EDR like that, and I ran into this in prior life, is the bad guys use legitimate processes. And what the EDRs will do with a legitimate process, they don't want to overreact to them. So they'll set like a priority three or priority four. Problem is you get quite a few of those and you don't know which one to go look at. And it ends up being random samples that just, or you go through all of them, right? With that part where we were telling you which endpoints were hit and everything else, it's going to take you right to the endpoint you need to go look at. And the, it'll tell you the process that it, the user was using to do it. So it's going to put you right over the, the P3 or P4 that you need to investigate. And we're telling you it's talking to a threat actor. So it's really not a P3 or P4 anymore. It's gone up here. Awesome. Um, yeah, it looks like we have a couple more here too. Um, can Lumu agent point which user executed um, a .x exe file in a server if I have the Windows agent installed? If, if you have the Windows agent, we're going to tell you what we triggered on when it was going to talk, communicating with the bad actor. All right. So there's three ways we collect data. Um, and, and it's meant to, to provide, you know, cover all the attack services. We have a virtual machine that it, um, collects those logs in the um, in enterprise. And the value of that is cameras, printers, OT, medical devices, anything that you can't put an EDR on, we're still going to see that communication out with that. For the, the cloud level, we have an API. And at the for the remote workforce, we have agents. Now, you can put agents on everything. It's just not required. When we have an agent on there, we can see who's logged in and what process they were being used. So the answer to the question, long answer to the question is yes. Um, yeah. How long does it normally take to investigate an incident? Industry standard, you know, we're talking, you know, having SIMs and tools and whatever else, you know, I've experienced this is 10 minutes plus, depending on the complexity, because you're, you're pulling together a, a bunch of different information and you as the human are usually providing the story around, you know, you're providing the, the, here's what all this means coming up. So going to those different disparate systems, that's what I meant by things in silos. When they don't talk to each other and work with each other, you have to create that as an individual. That is what is what at Lumu is at our, our, our core. We integrate with basically everything. We have over 80 integrations and we're growing, you know, several a month. We just keep going. And chances are, if you have it, we're, we're integrated with it. And by that, we mean we're easy to install. It's out of the box. Click the button, you know, enter a, a couple bits of information and you're up and running. There's no training the model there's no pattern like that we're immediately blocking those indicators of compromise um yeah a couple more here um have you ever stopped ransomware yeah we have um uh, now we we have 
most of the major banks in Latin America, we had one that had what was called our, our insights, which didn't automatically block at the time. And, you know, we have a 24 by seven threat Intel group. It's not a sock, you know, but you have access to him. You can click on the question mark and ask him for detail on what you're seeing. But they happened to notice that, you know, there was a lot of activity going on in this one customer. They weren't doing anything about it. And it was cobalt strike. And, you know, we, we called them up. I mean, you know, it's not what we normally, I mean, we try and watch, but you know, it's, it's not what we're responsible for, but we call them up and said, Hey, <laughs> you know, You've got cobalt strike in your network. You need to get on it fast. They were in the in the middle of an active ransomware. They bought Defender about 15 minutes later because all of that would have been stopped back up chain. So they had to go through a lot of remediation. But yeah, we we definitely did. We see that a lot. We see Emotet. We see cobalt strike, Quackbot. Fortunately, you know, Quackbot took a took a shot in the chops from the the FBI and stuff recently. And we'll, hopefully, we'll it, it, you know with these things when they squash them, they scatter. You know. So you'll you'll see it in other forms, but but yeah, the, the answer to the question is yes. We we have definitely stopped you know um, ransomware attacks before before they even got started. Awesome. All right, looks like we do have one last question here. Uh, what is the most common incident you see? Email. It's stuff coming in through email is you know ninety percent. It's always email, and probably because it's got the human involved. Um, you know, the weakest link in any chain, you know, kind of thing, but the, it's always going to be the humans. And they're very, I mean, that, you know, we talked about chat GBT, there's a thing out there called worm GBT, right? And it's basically training people who don't speak English how to write really good emails to fish people. I mean, it's just getting harder and harder and harder, right? So it's, it, you know, they can change an ampersand to look like an A. I mean, you know, the differences in the links, all the techniques you have for spotting that are just getting harder and harder. So Email is usually the the source. Um, the second one, believe it or not, is people leaving ports open. Uh, if you've ever been to Shodan, the the creepy baby monitor site or whatever, you know they have scanners to look. At. It's like them driving down the street and looking for open doors. If you leave, you know, remote access open on your network, they're going to find it. They have they're constantly looking for that. And I can't tell you how many times I had to go say it was the MSP that actually did it. You know, so. That's not that's uncomfortable because it was usually the MSP that brought us in, not Lumu, Prior Life, you know. But as an instant responder, that's who brought us in. Main things email. That's why the email intelligence is really um, helpful and efficient within uh, Lumu. It's like you know we're not blocking the emails, so you're not having to deal with that, but we block it when someone clicks on it and it gives you the intelligence you need to go take care of it with the humans and technically. Perfect. Well, thanks, Jeff, for yeah going through all those questions. I'm gonna now pass it back to uh, Lexi for a few closing statements, but appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again, Jeff, for your participation. I want to thank all of our participants for joining us today. We hope that you found this webcast informative and helpful to you and your organization. 